Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. This episode of the Sports Spectrum Podcast, part two of our conversation with Gene Chizik, former Auburn head football coach, 2010 national champion, is brought to you by Compassion International. We love Compassion. Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. That's the website, Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. We're grateful. We're thankful for them partnering with us here on the podcast and at Sports Spectrum because what they're doing is so important and it's such a neat way for all of us to make a difference in a child's life, releasing them from poverty. I mean, no child deserves to be in poverty. No child deserves to be neglected and not have the basic essentials that every single child deserves. Food, education, medical care, vocational training, all done in the name of Jesus. That's what Compassion International does. $38 a month, your sponsorship releases a child from poverty. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. It's the holiday season. I promise you, you won't regret it. Sponsor a child today. Our guest today is Gene Chizik, part two of our conversation with the former Auburn head football coach, 2010 national champion, and now ESPN and SEC network analyst, Gene Chizik. And yesterday in part one, you heard his story of television, what he's been doing as a broadcaster, and certainly how his family and the time spent with his family have played a part and played a role in his broadcasting journey. And we also talk about his faith journey as well. And the coaching grind, which is just, uh, it really is a grind when you talk about going from Clemson to Middle Tennessee to Stephen F. Austin to UCF to Auburn to Texas Iowa State, then to Auburn again. I mean, it's really a grind moving every single year, it feels like sometimes. And Coach talks about that in part one. Today in part two, we get a little more football and talk about the 2010 National Championship season. We also talk about Cam Newton, who was his Heisman Trophy winning quarterback, and what he thinks about Cam and the way that his career and his journey has has blossomed and flourished in the NFL as a quarterback. Such a unique player Cam Newton is, uh, and really on his way, in my opinion, to a Hall of Fame career. And then, of course, I had to ask Coach Chiswick about the Iron Bowl, Auburn and Alabama, that great rivalry that those two teams have. And lastly, the question that I, I of course, had to ask in many ways is, is he going to coach again? And so Coach answers that question at the end of this podcast. So let's take a listen. Part two of our conversation with Gene Chiswick, former Auburn head football coach, 2010 national champion here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Coach, who were some of the mentors and teachers that you look back at now and realize how much they meant to you in your coaching journey through the years? Well, if you're talking the coaching portion of that, Danny Ford gave me my first opportunity at Clemson, and I will always be forever grateful to Coach Ford. Uh, Spending two years with him there at Clemson uh, in the late 80s, uh, that was the beginning of my college journey. Uh, My high school journey was a man named Sam Roper, who to this day is a great friend of mine. Uh, He gave me my first high school job that we mentioned, Uh, and he was a high school coach of mine. Uh, He was one of my high school coaches and um, uh, just a a great friend to this day. And and even my father-in-law, who's now passed away, people don't realize it, but I, I, I married my head coach's daughter from high school. Oh, okay. Um, And so, and he passed away uh, two years ago, uh, but, uh, you know, he had a lot of influence on my life as well, just as a player back playing for him. And then as you go through the college years, a guy at Middle Tennessee who was phenomenal in my molding of a coach was a guy named Boots Donnelly. And um, Boots was just outstanding and what a great coach at Middle Tennessee. And he was very successful and he gave me a great opportunity uh, and, uh, you know, then I moved on to Stephen F. Austin and my head coach there was John Pierce, great Christian man who really, uh, was phenomenal with me, hired me as a young guy, then made me, gave me my first defensive coordinator job. I don't know, probably at 31 or two years old, mm. um, and, and a great league at the time as a one double a league with, uh, uh, out of the Southland conference. Um, you know, it was, uh, it was a great experience for me. And then, you know, moving forward with 
uh, you know, Mac Brown years later having a huge influence on my life. And uh, today, even today, we're we're great friends. Um, you know, uh, ADs along the way that have been Jamie Pollard at Iowa State, just a phenomenal guy, gave me my first head coaching job uh, at Iowa State and just a great uh great person and, and a great friend of mine. So, I mean, I, I can just go on and on about guys that have had significant influence in my life. And, and uh, I, I just really appreciate those people and I'll forever be indebted to all those guys. How was that when you first got your, your first head coaching job with Iowa state and just that transition from being a coordinator or an assistant to being the guy, what was that transition like for you? Well, it's like drinking water out of a fire hose. That's what it was like. <laughs> and I don't think people really understand what a huge undertaking that is, particularly if you haven't been a head coach uh, and what that in- entails. But uh, it, it was eye opening. Uh, you know, f- you know, there, Jason, there's 30 decisions you make a day, hmm. almost every day. And it's it's, a, it, you know, it's. Like I said, you, you, you can't train anybody for that. It's eye opening because the only way you can walk, uh, in, in that position, I mean, the only way you can experience what's real in that position is to walk it. And I used to sit there as an assistant and be sitting there and and going, how hard can it be? Right. How hard can it be? Well, (laughs) it's, it's difficult. And people argue that they make so much money in X, Y, and Z and, and and a great, Granted, there's a lot of money involved in those jobs, but let me tell you something. On a daily basis, when you're in charge of 120, 125 kids, uh, 50 staff members, and uh, so many other administrators, uh, it's it can be overwhelming at times uh, until you get organized and figure it all out. And it took me about two years to do that, but um, it's uh, it's it's a job that's a huge undertaking. You're a CEO of a company of a lot of people. And, you know, with social media and things of that these days, it's changed the game. You're, you're in charge not only with 125 young guys that are 18 to 22 year old, but their feelings every day because they can put their feelings out there and everybody can know it every day. Mm. And it becomes a huge challenge. So uh, but there's a lot of things that go with it. But I loved every minute of it. And again, I wouldn't change a thing about it. So let's talk about Auburn. Obviously, we've gone this long and we haven't even mentioned the, the 2010 team yet. But let's talk about that coming to Auburn and then certainly getting to the mountaintop when it comes to uh, sports and it comes to, you know, being a coach and winning the title in 2010 and cams there and wins the Heisman trophy. It's the dream season in so many ways. So much we could talk about, about that year. What, let's just start with what stands out to you the most when I, ta- when I ask you about, or anybody asks you about it, because I'm sure you get asked about it every day about that 2010 season and just winning the title. Well, what stands out to me is the phenomenal young men that we had on our team who had been through so much. You know, they made a change. They they had let go of Tommy Tuberville two years earlier, and, you know, that's who recruited most of these guys. And, and we brought in the Nick Fairleys and the Cam Newtons of the world that year um, who hadn't experienced, you know, what some of those seniors – and we had a lot of seniors on that team, Jason. What stands out mm. is just what a great team scenario that was. You know, we didn't have – here's what we had. We had the best offensive player in the country and what I consider to be the best defensive player in the country in Nick Fairley, a defensive tackle. And other than that, we just had good college guys. I mean, we got very few. I think we have, other than those two, I think we have one guy that might still be playing off that team. And we just didn't have, we didn't have anybody, hardly anybody drafted uh, because they were just good college teammates. They were good college players that wanted to, you know, collectively stay together as a group because they came in. And I think that year we had close to 30 seniors and they just, they, they just wanted to end their, their career correctly. They wanted to end it with something that nobody thought they could do. And they just bonded together and they started to believe in each other. And the chemistry was really, really good. And our coaches did a phenomenal job of keeping them laser focused on the job at hand every week uh, and what's really crazy that people don't understand is how many close games yes. that we played that year. And I think the reason we were able to win every one of them, and you know, Jason, it's hard to go undefeated. I mean, go ahead and look at every national championship team for the last 15 years and see which ones were undefeated. Okay. It's just hard to do. You know, we did it at Texas five years earlier in 2005, but it's hard to do. 
And every close game that we played, because these kids believed each other, because they were such a great team together, united, we were able to never panic and always be able to pull those games out, including the walk-off kick to win the national championship. So that's what I'll always remember, uh, just a group of guys that weren't all great football players, uh, but they, they, they were a great team team because you look these days on guys that win the national championship how many first round draft picks they've got they've got them all over on offense they've got them all over on defense first round picks second round picks third round picks we didn't have that yeah we had one great player on offense one great player on defense and we had a bunch of good college players and that's that's what made it very satisfying to me so a couple more things I want to talk about regarding that team. First is, and maybe just in general, what that Iron Bowl experience is like. That year, you guys beat Alabama 28-27 to uh, and won the SEC championship, of course, going on to win the title, but the Iron Bowl game. And there's so many great memories, and it's coming up here. And I know uh, even by the time this interview airs, it may have already passed, but I think you can still talk about what that Iron Bowl experience, that rivalry is like between Auburn and Alabama. Well, I've been in seven of them. Um, so there's some people out there that have been in more, but I've been quite a few. And, and there's nothing like it, Jason. It's hard to explain unless you've been in it. Mm -hmm. uh, the true passion and the true rivalry. I don't know that. And look, I've been in great ones. I've been in Texas OU. I've been in Florida, Florida State. I've been in Florida, Georgia. I've been in South Carolina, uh, Clemson. Yeah. This one is different than all of them. And it's so passionate and there's so much writing on it because in this state, there are no professional sports. So everything is about Auburn and Alabama football 24-7. Yeah. And let me tell you, after that game, the loser, you got to talk a bunch of folks off the ledge. I mean, that's just <laughs> the way it is because they're living with it for the next 364 days and it never goes away. Yeah. It never goes away. It never goes away in the coffee shop, the donut shop. It never goes away at work. It never goes away. Uh, it just, it, it, it's just, it's there and it haunts you, uh, you know, until you have a chance to go back and win it again. But that, that day in Tuscaloosa, we, you know, we went down 24, nothing and it did not look good. And, uh, but like I said, going back to kind of the team part of our guys, um, we, we slept, walked through the first half on both sides of the ball. We got in the locker room and we had scored a touchdown to make it 24, seven. We had the ball coming out and I said, here's what we're going to do. And I wasn't sure if we were going to do it or not, but I had to give them—I <laughs> had to give them the vote of hope. I said, "We're going to go down. We're going to take this very first drive down. We're going to make this 24-14, and it's a ten-point game, and it's on." <laughs> well, I think on the second or third play, we ended up throwing—I think we ended up throwing a touchdown to Terrell Zachary down the sideline, and we did go 24-14. And then all of a sudden, everybody started clicking, and everybody started believing, and. You know, just kind of rolled from there. But it's a tough place to play. It's an unbelievable rivalry that only you can, I guess, appreciate as much as it needs to be appreciated if you've been in it. Uh, and um, like I said, I've I've been uh, I've been in it seven times. I've won four and lost three, so at least I'm ahead of the curve. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you about put on your analyst hat for a minute. Just fast forwarding now to 2018 and just the success that the the Crimson Tide have had, Alabama has had, and now you got to kind of be an analyst from the outside and just look at this team and its dominance. It really is amazing what they're able to do year in and year out, specifically this year and how good they've been. Can anybody, can they, anyone beat them, do you think? Are they beatable? I don't think so, Jason. Yeah. I, I really don't. I, I think that what Nick has done there, uh, and again, I've been able the last two years being able to see this whole league, every game, game in and game out for two years, what he has done there is unprecedented. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, he has got the, I will say the right formula. He has got the formula. The formula has been figured out and it, it never cracks. It never breaks. Uh, he has, he knows exactly what he wants recruiting wise. He has set the standard for recruiting and plugging in coaches and players. Cause you got to think, how many coaches has Nick lost over the last five years? It's incredible. It doesn't matter who the O coordinator is. It doesn't matter who the D coordinator is. Yeah. You know, it's a revolving door because obviously the success they had plucks their assistants out of there. Uh, but it doesn't matter who it is. Uh, Nick always has the ship running exactly the way, you know, he wants it. 
And they're playing this time of the year in 2018. They're hitting on all cylinders. Their defense has had back-to-back shutouts against Mississippi State and LSU. Uh, Their offense, obviously, with a quarterback that's a first-round draft pick, is the best in the country. Uh, And they're never on a shortage of players. And so um, it's cruising in the exact same direction it's been – uh, you know, for the last several years under Nick. And like I said, what he has been able to accomplish there, in my opinion, on the outside looking in is unprecedented. Let me ask you about Cam just for a minute. You know, it's been, you know, eight years now since you coached him and he's gone on to really great success in the NFL. And I think, in, especially from a maturity level, uh, he's grown a lot too, besides winning the MVP and certainly Rookie of the Year and taking his team to a Super Bowl. But he's still... Seems like he's having fun out there and is a kid, but there's a maturity about him now. I don't even know if you're still close with him or if you still have conversations with him, but what are your thoughts on how Cam has evolved and, and what his NFL career has kind of turned into? Yeah, I'm really proud of him. And I think the the word you, you used is spot on. I think he's matured a lot, Jason. And, you know, that league will do it to you. You know, he came in the league as a kid and now yeah. he's a 30, you know, 31 year old, 30 or 31 year old man. Uh, and he he absolutely loves the game. He's the most competitive guy I've, I've been around. You know, I've been on – I've had like five first-round quarterbacks on my teams, dating all the way back to Dante Culpepper in the late 90s. This is the most competitive guy I've ever been around, and he absolutely loves the game. He has a blast playing the game. He still wants the ball in his hand with the game on the line. He thrives on it. He loves it. Uh, And he's matured. And, you know, this is year probably seven or eight. Now, this is probably year eight for him in the NFL. And let me tell you something. The way he looks out there and the way he's kept his body and and really taking care of himself, he looks like he's got another seven. I'm surprised if he's got a 14, 15-year career uh, because he's that healthy, he takes care of himself, and the game means that much to him. But – uh, just watching him mature as a player on the field has been really fun to watch. A couple more questions here with Gene Chizik on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. When your time ended at Auburn um, just a couple years later, which is kind of how, you know, when you look back and you see God's plan and you're like, okay, the highest of high and then the lowest of lows in many ways, how difficult of a season that was that for you to walk through as a coach and just as a husband and a dad? Yeah, it was extremely difficult, Jason, and, and – um, You know, like I said, I wouldn't change anything on the way anything has unfolded, as painful as that was. Uh, You know, what's really the most painful part of that was trying to really shield my wife and children from all of the stuff out there. Because, you know, in so many ways, you're just buried in the bunker and and not that you don't know what's going on and what's being said and, and how you're getting crucified out there. And that just comes with the territory if you. You know, if you can't handle that, you don't need that job. Uh, but, you know, it, what was tough is trying to shield my young family. My kids were still in high school and middle school, and it was just a really difficult scenario just trying to, you know, make sure they were okay, uh, which they weren't. They weren't okay with it, you know, and that, that was very painful to me uh, because, you know, look, coaching is what I chose to do. And all of the things that come with it is, you know, what they end up getting, good or bad. And, you know, it was the first time really my kids and my wife had ever seen me perception-wise in the public fail, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Um, And and in my 30-year career, it was the first time that, you know, I felt like, you know, that I was being pegged as the failure, uh, which comes with the territory. But I can handle that. Not that I like it, but what became hard to handle was that my kids and my wife were seeing that and hearing that. And there was no rebuttal. There was nothing you can say. There's nothing you can do. And they, they, it it crushed them. And, um, you know, so it was a real painful time for sure. And, uh, but you know, from a business standpoint, I understand the business, uh, that I agree with, you know, I felt like I could fix it a hundred percent. Um, there's nobody that knew more on how to fix it than I did. Um, and I had a good grip on that, uh, but they chose to go in a different direction. So, um, you know, it's business and people have to make business decisions. So I respected that decision. Uh, doesn't mean that I had to agree with it. 
Um, you know, again, if you if you win the national championship two years earlier and it's the best season you've ever had, right? Then when it's the worst season you've ever had, you know, to me, you ought to be able to have a chance to fix it. But that's not my call. So uh, never questioned it. Uh, just moved on, and and this is where. I think, you know, God has really shown up in my life with being able to look back on things like that. And, you know, Jason, I never question, you know, why. And, you know, a lot of people say, you know, they'll question their faith and they'll question. I never did that. I've never done that to this day. I've always just trusted that there's a purpose in everything. Uh, And, you know, if I would have stayed the head coach at Auburn, I don't know what that meant. You know what I mean? I don't know what what else could have been lying down there further down the road that might not have been good. So I just know that I was protected from whatever it was. That was what needed to happen. Uh, And, you know, God provided that. So I I don't look back on any of that stuff. And that's why I can really look back on 30 years and say I have no regrets because I just believe that God has walked in and carved my path. And, you know, I've got what I've got when it was good. It was God provided it and it was bad God provided it for a reason. So, um, but it was, it was, it was very painful for me um, on an individual level, because you can go back and look at my track record through 30 years of coaching. That's probably the only year that you could say that, you know, perceptionally uh, I had, I had failed Mm -hmm. and that was difficult for me to stomach uh, as a, as a man. Uh, It was hard. Uh, but you know, you live, you learn, you move on and, and you don't look back. I'm not a guy that looks back in the past and, and dwells on things. I'm, I'm always a guy that looks forward and, and, uh, you know, tries to move on to the next thing and do it with a positive attitude and a lot of energy. And of course the old adage, we were talking about it beforehand when God, when we make plans, God, God just laughs because he's got the perfect plan all in mind for all of us. But I wonder if, your plans in your mind, and maybe God has these plans too, would be to coach again. Is that something you'd like to do? Well, you know, Jason, I've been approached several, every year, several times, um, including this year, to be honest with you. And here's my thing. Um, I love the TV world. Uh, I love what I'm doing at ESPN. I love the life that it gives me. Uh, Would I never say, I'll never say never to anything, Sure. Um, but for the different people that have called, uh, to, you know, kind of gauge interest, you know, I have, you know, I tell them it's just, it's gotta be the perfect scenario and I got to feel really good about it. You know, and every decision that I've made in my life always comes down to a gut decision, but you, you know what that is, Jason, a gut decision is a God decision. That's, That's right. what it is. Yep. And, um, you know, if the decision in my gut feels right and it is right. Um, I'm not adverse to doing it. Uh, if I want to coach, I'm, I'm in great health right now. I've, I've got 10, 15 years left of me if I wanted it. Um, but again, for me to want it, it's got to be that perfect fit that, that allows me to enter back in and have a lot of fun doing it. Uh, I'm the point in my life where everything is a decision made on quality of life. And if it's not the quality of life that I want, um, which is fun and enjoyable and having impacts on people. Um, I don't have to do it. And like I said, God's just blessed me to the point in my life where I have options right now. And, and quite frankly, I'm, I'm, you know, I want to take the best option. And so we'll see. Um, people ask me that question a lot. And, um, right now I'm really happy doing what I'm doing. That's good. Let me ask you this. This is our final question. And we ask this to all of our guests here on the podcast in this season of life where God has you, where you are, what are you learning from him? What has the Lord been teaching you right now uh, in this season of life for Gene Chizik? You know, uh, to really just wake up every morning and be thankful and enjoy every day, man. I mean, every day, a great friend of mine, he, uh, he was actually my team chaplain. Uh, him and I've been, he was our strength coach back at Stephen F. Austin years ago And, uh, he's a pastor of a church now. Um, uh, but he was my team chaplain at Iowa state. One of my best friends on the planet, you know, he looks up one day and, you know, his wife is no longer here because of cancer. Mm. And, you know, I I try to look at those moments, man. I, I, I really, Jason, 
I, I embrace every day. I can't look at what's happening in a week. And, and I, I know that really sounds cliche, but man, when my feet hit the floor every morning, I just say, God, thank you for this one day, man. And let, I just want this day to be phenomenal. And then do the same thing the next day and not really try to put a whole lot of thought into a week from now, three weeks from now, man, just embrace the fact that, uh, that, you know, he, God gave you another day. I don't know if you follow me on Twitter or not, but if you don't, it's at coach Gene Chizik. And I, I have a lot of, I have a lot of tweets out there and one of them is going to be uh, a really cool one the other day or uh, that, that I'm going to put out um, here in a couple of days. And it's about opening up your eyes every morning and you'll see what it is, but it's really, it's just the blessing of waking up to being able to open my eyes. Yeah. I mean, it's that simple. And, uh, I'm just blessed because my family's healthy, they're happy, and uh, I'm just living the dream right now. And it's all because <laughs> what you know God's been able to provide for me. To be honest with you, yeah. The Twitter handle again is at Gene Chiswick, and I like your hashtag. It's words of chisdom, <laughs> which is awesome. <laughs> Who'd ever thought you'd be a social media guy, right? Yeah, I know. What's funny is when I first got on it a couple of years ago, um, they they we had this contest what, you know, cause people were replying to some tweets and going, wow, that's some really good stuff. And so some, a friend of mine suggested, he said, why don't you put it out there like a contest? So we did. And that, that one where they actually voted on it cool. and that one. And then what's even for, more funny or more ironic about it, Jason, is we actually do a segment on the sec network on our shows on Saturday nights. Um, most nights we'll do like a words of chisdom, uh, segment. It's hilarious, That's but, awesome. uh, I've had fun with it, man. I mean, yeah, who'd ever thought I'm a social media guy, <laughs> but I don't know if I'll go that far, but I, I do like tweeting and, and, uh, I do like putting my thoughts out there. And so, Hey, whoever's listening to this follow at coach Gene Chizik and you might get a couple good laughs. Absolutely. Coach Chizik, Gene Chizik. It's been so great to catch up with you and I always enjoyed my time when we spent uh, time together at ESPN, and I'm grateful you took the time to come on this podcast. So thanks for joining us, and we'll, we'll catch up again soon, I hope. I appreciate it, Jason. Thanks for having me on, oh, man. Good luck with everything. And we do thank Coach Gene Chizik. I'll always call him a coach. The former Auburn head football coach, 2010 national champion, SEC network analyst, for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Make sure you go back and listen to part one from yesterday and certainly part two today. Lots of good stuff there from the coach. And follow him over on Twitter at Coach Gene Chizik. At Coach Gene Chizik and his words of Chisdom, which I always enjoy looking at and following on Twitter. So we appreciate Gene Chizik for joining us here on the podcast. And we're also appreciative to Compassion International, our sponsors here on the podcast, for all the great work that they're doing releasing children from poverty. And here's how you can be a part of it for $38 a month. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. That's the website, Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. You'll see a list of children there just waiting, waiting to be sponsored. And you pick, you choose, you pray certainly about it. You find the child that you want to sponsor. Maybe you want to sponsor two or three. And for $38 per child, $38 a month, you release that child from poverty and release them from the hope that they feel like they have lost. And you give them that hope by sponsoring them through compassion, food, education, and medical care, all done in the name of Jesus. Compassion International, that's the place to go. It's the perfect time of year, the holiday season, the Christmas season, to give them the gift, this amazing gift of being released from poverty. Compassion.com slash sports spectrum. Sponsor a child today. Thanks for listening to this episode of the podcast. You can email me directly, jason at sportspectrum.com. Of course, we would love to have you leave a review of this podcast on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and of course, download and subscribe to this podcast everywhere podcasts are found, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, you name it, we're there. Subscribe to the podcast, download it, listen, tell your friends, go to your Facebook page, your Twitter page, your Instagram page, screen grab this 
podcast, send it to them, send it out, let them know about the stories on the intersection of sports and of faith. Also want to tell you about a great deal we have going on at sportspectrum.com. It's $18 for an entire year, and you can subscribe to our Sports Spectrum magazine. It makes a great gift for a family member, a friend, anyone who loves sports and loves Jesus. The Sports Spectrum magazine makes the perfect gift. Go to sportspectrum.com and subscribe today. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time right here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Have a great rest of your day.